Hi, I'm Gary Klaus with Genesis Rescue Systems. Welcome to Live Cut 3, Making the Cut. If you haven't already, when you're done with this, go back and watch our first two live cuts. The first one is reading the wreck, and the second is the Genesis angle on spreaders. That'll give you a good basis of information as to what we're doing with your extrication tools. Helping me today is Anthony Fleming. Anthony is the chief of Fallowfield Township Fire Department in Pennsylvania, and also the Eastern, Eastern U.S. representative for Genesis Rescue. This is Brent Solon. Brent is the Midwest Regional Representative and the former Chief of Dakota, Minnesota Fire Department. This is Cami Klaus. Cami is a flight paramedic with the Cleveland Care Critical Transport Team and also a firefighter in Orange Village, Ohio, up in the Cleveland area. So today we're going to talk about using your cutters, how to best use your cutters, working with the cutters that you have, and potentially some of the information that some of you aren't quite familiar with as far as cutting. If you've ever struggled to make the cuts, hopefully today's program will give you a little bit of information as to how to make your cuts easier. So let's talk about cutter sizes. Matt, take a shot of the three cutters that you have in front of you. So the first cutter that you see there is a C95 cutter. I'm gonna move that out of the way for one second, Brent. <clears throat> so that cutter weighs 45 pounds. The cutter that you see in the center weighs 47 pounds. And this big monster over here is the baddest cutter on the planet at the moment. This is our new F7 cutter, the only cutter capable of making F7 material cuts. This cutter weighs 61 pounds. The bigger cutting forces that you're going to run into on the new steels of the vehicles that are out there now are going to require larger and larger piston sizes and heavier and heavier duty cutters. Somebody whose cami size is probably going to struggle with a 61 pound cutter. Somebody who's Anthony's size is not going to have a problem with that whatsoever. It's not the everyday cutter that you're going to use or that any fire departments really have on their trucks. This is really a specialized unit. Some of the other cutters, the little bit of a smaller size cutter, Kim, go ahead and grab that one. Brent, I'm going to have you grab the 240, and Anthony, go ahead and grab the 270. <clears throat> so this is the way most people stand at an extrication scene you waiting for their cutters to be used. The big thing you want to keep in mind is the only thing that gets tired at an extrication scene is you, regardless of the cutter size and model that you have. So one of the things you want to keep in mind is always keep your cutter blades open and ready to go. And as long as you're in the open and ready to go position, you can literally just drop the tips right down on the ground. You're going to stay a lot fresher longer when you're doing that, okay? The handles are adjustable on these tools, and we want to keep in mind that you want to kind of match the cutter that you have to the person. It would be difficult, like I said, for Cami to maneuver a 61-pound tool, but it's still possible, okay? So we're going to put those down for a second. We're also going to talk about spreaders for just a little bit. Cam, I'm going to have you come right over here. So when you're sizing spreaders for your department also, you want to keep in mind the capabilities of the people that you have in your department. If you have somebody who's Anthony's size, larger and heavier, heavier spreaders really aren't a problem whatsoever. If you have people that are smaller stature, maybe a smaller spreader might be better for you, okay? Again, keep in mind that you want your spreader tips always to be completely closed. This is a 24-inch spreader. This is a 32-inch spreader. Our 24-inch spreader weighs 38 pounds. Our 54-inch spreader weighs 46 pounds. It's not a tremendous amount of difference, but you want to keep all that in mind when you're sizing tools for your department. So let's talk about cutting just a little bit, okay? Let's walk around to the far side over there. Brent, if you'd be so kind to grab me that cutter. <clears throat> you got the shot, man? Thanks. We're going to grab this one, too, so we get a nice little close-up. So one of the things that you want to be careful of when you're using your cutters is exactly where you're making your cuts. Hold on one second. So if you're cutting from this side and you have no idea what's going on in here, if you look inside to the opposite side, you'll see that we have an adjustable seat belt mount right here. When you have an adjustable seat belt mount, you're going to have some type of track. Now, depending on the manufacturer, that track could go all the way down and go all the way up. You're not going to have an easy time cutting through a bolt like this, keeping in mind that this goes up and down. You're probably not going to have a great time cutting through a bolt like that either. So if you're starting to make your cut and the cutter kind of stalls out just a little bit, you may want to maneuver up or down just a little bit, okay? So let's take a look at our cuts. All right, Brent. Depending on your cutter, and this is where you want to experiment a little bit, okay? We're going to look at our post. Some people like to cut and they'll say, it's best to cut with the high side high. Brent, would you be able to make that cut for me? 
and stop right there. So what we want to take note of is how does the cutter that you have in your department react if you start with your high side high? Does your cutter walk itself up? Does it continue to walk itself down? Okay, just go ahead and give a cut. Now you guys can see from Matt's angle. Go ahead, make your cut. That the blades wound up basically horizontal. So now I'm gonna have Anthony back up a little bit. Now we're gonna cut a little bit different. Now we're gonna cut in the opposite direction. Let's see what our blades do now. And stop right there. So you can see what angle we started with and you can see what angle, how that tool naturally rotated itself up a little bit. We always like to say that it's usually best if you cut straight across at a 90 degree angle to what you're cutting. So we get a little bit of rotation, but not a tremendous amount. These are things that you want to go out and practice at your own department. So when you're doing this, get to the junkyard, take a look, let everybody in your department cut a couple of times, start on one angle, start on the other angle, start on a third angle. Remember, this is not a speed evolution. This is, let's see the way our cutters operate, especially if you have smaller or older cutters, okay? Believe it or not, you can actually bend the blades on those cutters. So if you guys have ever been cutting in an extrication scene or just in practice, and you watch your blades separate and open, that's one of two things. Either your blades are bent because you can actually bend them out, and that's usually by getting them to rotate out constantly. Your center bolt is loosened up. It's not torqued down to the right specs. Okay, that's number two. Actually, I guess there's a third. When you open your blades up and you see a bunch of little like mushrooms and bumps and things like that, all those mushrooms and bumps will not allow your blades to cut cleanly across. Every time that mushroom hits, you're going to see your tips separate. So if you've had a lot of incidents where you're making your cut and all of a sudden your blades rotate and turn really, really severely and you see those blades separate, make sure your guys stop immediately, open your cutters up, Go in a little bit deeper, if at all possible, and try to get that cut as straight as possible. That's going to be one of the keys for cutting with you. So we're going to come to this side. Brent, I'm going to have you cut a little bit down here. Here's the other thing that we want to look at. I'm going to turn this on. So here's our seatbelt pretensioner. Mind you that a lot of times this is hidden in plastic, okay? We know that with the exception of a Volvo, where the seatbelt pretensioner charge is up a little bit higher, most of the time the manufacturers have the charge put right down into here. And if you take a look right here, you can see this little yellow clip is the firing mechanism for the pretensioner. What we don't want to do is cut into that. Now, I know you're going to say, well, how am I supposed to see that if there's a lot of plastic there? <clears throat> that I can't tell you. You may want to try to get this plastic popped out of the way. Sometimes, unfortunately, you're just going to have to cut in there. So the lower you're going to be able to cut, the better it's going to be, okay? If you can get in there and take a peek from the back side, see literally anything, that may be the best thing for your cutter to do. So Brent, let's go ahead and get ready to position that cut. Okay, start to make your cut and stop if you would. And stop right there. So, Anthony, would you be so kind to give me that New York hook, please? <clears throat> This is where some people are going to run into trouble. Depending on the manufacturer, and I know you can do it with ours, that's not gonna be an issue. I'm not gonna necessarily recommend this for anybody else's equipment. But if you see that your tool is walking in towards the car itself, and you can see how this tool is basically center lining itself into, and this happens with everyone's tool, it happens with everybody's tool, especially corded tools, you have to be careful. So if you see that's going to happen, one of the things that you can do is before you put your cutter into place, Brent, go ahead and back me out. You can take a steel, steel New York hook on Genesis tools, and you want to make sure it's from the rocker panel to the roof line. You can put that in the body of our tool, and it will stop that drift of the actual tool itself. 
Now, I'm not going to recommend you do this with any of the other manufacturer's tools. I'm just telling you, this is something you can do to stop that inward rotation. Go ahead and make that cut for me if you'd be so kind. Perfect. Good. Now, depending on the strength of the car, point up at me for a second, Matt. So depending on the strength of the car, you can actually bend one of these if there's enough force in the cut area that you're making. I had one on my truck in Northeast Ohio for many, many, many years, and I bent the crap out of it on 2015 Ford Excursion, I believe it was. So if that happens in your department, I did not say this out loud, but bend it. Blame it on B-shift or A-shift or C-shift, depending on what your shift is, and just turn it around and bend it back the other way the next time. All right, Brent, let's come in and finish that cut. Make sure that somebody's holding on to that piece. Now, take a look at the difference. You can see how that tool is walking itself in. <clears throat> Go ahead. That's one of those really critical things, especially if you have a patient in that passenger compartment. And I'm sure you guys have all seen that where the tool has walked all the way in. Extremely important that your people are cognizant of where they're standing and how that tool shuts off. This is no denigration of anybody else's equipment, but if you have a throttle control type grip, if you're right-handed, most of the time, the operational mode of that tool is away from your body. Most firefighters focus on the working ends of the tools. They're watching the cutters cut, they're watching the spreader spread, and they pay no attention to where their operational hand is. So if you have pigtails coming out the back and that tool walks itself in, you have a potential for snapping a pigtail off. If you have your hand caught in that position, depending on how you position the cutter to start, which we'll talk about on the far side just a little bit more, but there's a potential that your hand is going to get caught in there. If that happens, the tool doesn't know that you're caught. The tool knows it's on. So you wanna be extremely cognizant of that because not only do you have to get your hand to come back to get the tool to stop moving inward direction, but then you have to reverse the direction to get that tool to release its grip on the steel that you're cutting. So these are things you wanna keep in mind. Just be extremely cognizant, not only of the working ends of the tool itself, but also of your operational control hand just for the safety of the operator itself. So let's come over here and take a look at our seat back. Can I have my camera there, Cody? Thank you, sir. So come on in here, Matt. <clears throat> so we've gone ahead and already removed all this seat back material for you. And again, you're not gonna do this in the real world, not to this extent. Hopefully you're gonna do a little bit because you wanna be able to determine what type of material is down here. Now these hinges are usually a harder type of steel, not necessarily the hardened or the ultra hardened strength, but a harder type of material, okay? You wanna to try to determine how it looks on the inside and potentially how it looks from the backside, okay? If you take a look right here, you'll see that we have an extra support bracket. Now just cutting blindly through here Depending on how you cut, sometimes one cutter will go underneath on one side and then come up on the opposite side. That means that our seat will not be completely cut out. It will literally still be attached by some way, shape, or form. If you can take a knife and get some of this crap out of your way so you can see what's here, a lot of times it'll be better, okay? The other thing you wanna watch out for is make sure you're not catching a pyrotechnic chart. So I'm gonna come around to the back side and Brent's gonna position his cutter in there. <clears throat> and stop right there. So, you can see that right now, literally all we have are the tips onto the hardened steel. Depending on how that material is inside the seat, and we never know because this is manufacturer specific, most people will slide their cutter in at a little bit of an exaggeration. If your blade comes in like this, guaranteed they're not going to dig into this material very, very easily whatsoever, and your tool will immediately rock itself upward. That's where you run the chance of a side load. And again, this is not just on a Genesis tool, this is on any manufacturer's tool. When you see your blades twist suddenly, stop, reposition, and get a deeper bite in. The other reason you want to kind of get some of this stuff out of your way is to see 
where am I going to cut the easiest? What's in the best interest of my patient? And remember, everything we do at extrication is always patient's condition and position dictated. If they need to get out super, super fast, we need to get them out as fast as humanly possible. If we've got a little bit of time to play, let's try not to jostle them as much as possible. So Brent, I'm gonna have you come up and just kind of slide up through here. So you, want, you can see how deep that bite is. Go ahead and make my cut right there if you'd be so kind. Perfect. So you can see where we cut through. We handle that with no difficulty whatsoever. When we try to cut down here, you're going to get a lot more of that rotation. And that is unavoidable just because the way the seed is manufactured, either with that round coil spring in there or some other type of mechanism. Now the tough part for us is if you take a look at the inside here, which is kind of dark to look at, but it's almost impossible to get in there. So can we maneuver this seat backwards a little bit? Yeah, we may be able to, but take a look here. See how my cut here is still intact? That's not going to allow me to move that seat all the way backwards. The visualization of the material that you're cutting is paramount to getting your patient out in the proper position and condition. We want to make the right cuts at every time all the way around in the extrication process. Okay, Brent, anything to add for that? Nope, that's uh, very good. Excellent. We're going to go around to the far side of the vehicle and see how things work there. There you go, Code. <coughs> So now I'm gonna have Anthony come in with the spreader and we're gonna talk about making that cut on the nader pin if things don't go quite perfectly. So Anthony's gonna come in, he's gonna give me a little crush down on this. We're gonna assume we have no purchase points whatsoever. Would you be so kind, sir? Back me up and give me a little bit more, if you would, a little bit more spread. Slip. Watch your slippage. Watch your slippage there. Give me a little bit more of a bite inside here. Give me a little bit more gap, please. Perfect, stop right there. Good, come on out of there. So let's take a look at the spread that we just made. And this is extremely common, okay? You saw how with the right angle, with that outside arm pushing down like we talked about in the last event, how we got that door to gap very, very nicely. So here's what happens on a lot of extrications, right? You can see how we've torn here just a little bit. Our nader's there, but it's not quite there. So a lot of times the next thing we do is we call for the cutter. Hey, cutter guy, come on in here. Most cutter guys don't, and this is gender neutral, so take no offense at that whatsoever. Most cutter people, how's that? Will just literally drop their cutter right on top without looking where the bottom sweep of that blade goes through. Brent, you wanna just drop me in for a second? Perfect. So if you take a look at where our cutter is right now, depending on how that comes apart, you can see how the outer skin is gapped just a little bit, our blade may or may not go through exactly where we want. So we want to make sure we're not just looking from here to see if we caught everything, but we also want to take a second to make sure that our blade literally goes through. And sometimes it's the most subtle adjustment, so we're just cutting the actual nader pin itself. Go ahead, Brent. So if we've made the cut properly, 
everything should just come right out of there. You can see how loose it is. Anthony, I'm gonna have you come in and just finish popping that door for me. Would you be so kind? Hold on, I'm gonna open this up. There you go, just take the rest of that door out just so it's open. So let's look at our gap right here. Perfect. So here's what we're gonna talk about. Most people will immediately think, boy, the more I pull that door open, the better this is going to be. Anthony, you wanna grab that for me? Got it. So let's take a look at how much gap we lose right here. Grab that door, would you please, Ann? So you can see how much distance, and go ahead and hyperextend it like most people will. So we started out about a gap and a half, maybe an inch and a half a gap, and now we're down to between a half and three quarters. So when your cutter person comes in, Brent, come on in here, let's wrap around that hinge. Okay. You can see how difficult that sometimes can be, where sometimes if we just kind of back that door up a little bit, you can see how much easier it is to wrap those blades all the way around the piece that we need. That's what we're trying to shoot for. If for whatever reason, you can't get your blades in here, if this is already closed up too much, don't be afraid to have your spreader guy come in from this side, give your cutter a little bit of a gap, and then he can maneuver. Anthony, let's go ahead and do that. Brent, go ahead and pull that sucker back. So, cool. Now we can move right down, do the bottom at the same time. Perfect. Thanks. All right, now we can open up that door again and let's watch the difference. You guys want to grab this door for Brent if you'd be so kind? So now. Watch, take a look at the difference. A lot of times people will just shove a cutter in there and they will literally just tip cut. If you hear your tool struggling, as soon as you start making that cut, most of the time your cutter is not gonna be in deep and you're gonna be cutting right here on the tip. You always want your cutter as deep into the blades as possible. That's where you get the ultimate cutting force. Go ahead, Brent. Yep, take the bottom one. You can see how those smooth cut blades walk themselves right in and give us the best bite all the way around. So, let's take a look at the front of the vehicle for just a second. So here's our other hinges. Depending on the cutter that you have, you have to be real cognizant of how much strength your cutter has and what it's going to be able to do for you. If you have smaller, older cutters, what, where are you going? <laughs> Cam, you wanna grab the uh, saws off for me? <clears throat> so, if you have smaller, older cutters, depending on the type of hinge that you have, sometimes you're going to make one cut, two cut, three cut, four cut, and it'll actually be faster with the older cutters. You guys come over and take a look. See how this hinge is here? It's got a little bit of beef. Again, this is a tiny little trick that you may or may not use depending on the cutter strength that you have. So Cammie, come on in here. Watch your sawzall angle. So let's take a quick little look right here. So we didn't make a massive cut. All you're literally doing is giving that a small little cut. Don't take the hinge all the way off if that's what's called for. I'm not saying that you can't take the hinge all the way off. But if you have older cutters, one of the things you can do is make that tiny little relief cut. 
That'll give it a split point for your older, smaller cutters to make that cut. Hopefully they'll walk right through, but it weakens the structure so your cutters can work to their ultimate performance. Brent, come on and let's take a look. Go to that side. So, so take a look. See how we're struggling with this right here? And this is going to happen on all things possible. So if you're the person with the cutter, don't struggle that crazily. Grab your spreader, bring it in, and give your cutter the best advantage possible. Remember, we can work together. The cutter and spreader are working at the same time. Cutter's already in position there. Spreader's gonna give them a little bit of a gap. Just make sure you don't catch your guy in the door. Good. Perfect, there you go, Brent, now let's go through. Hit it. The other thing to point out, Gary, why we got this here, it's also critical that you have both of your blades on either side of the pin. In other words, I don't want to cross load this. I don't want my bottom uh, blade to be on this side of the pin and my upper blade on the other. Excellent. So now we've got a nice big opening made. You can see how even though we cut on this side, you can see the separation that we made just by making that tiny little escharotomy, how you got a nice little gap there. Again, it's not going to work every single time, but it just gives you a nice operation. So real quick, let's talk about hatchbacks. Matt, come around to the far side. I'm going to bring Anthony and Brent in with the cutter and the spreader. One thing you want to be real cognizant of. If you have a hatchback, you know that inside those pillars, you're gonna have at least two gas struts, something just like this. We don't just wanna blindly cut through anything. If you have a hatchback that has a window that lifts up also, you will have at least three gas struts and sometimes even four like the car that you see in front of you. If you have to cut the gas struts, don't cut through here always cut through the smooth, shiny portion, whether it's black or silver, and make sure you're always cutting at a right angle. So, depending on the car that you have and the impact, right, I'm gonna have Matt stay on that side. So if you guys take a look right here, you can see that this particular car already has a purchase point that we can use, okay? This is probably where we would start. If you don't have a purchase point, this is what you see quite often. Come on over, Anthony. You'll see guys do this all the time. Go ahead. So, did we make somewhat of a purchase point? Yes. Did we just scare the crap out of the person that was inside the car? Double yes. Remember, when you're doing an extrication, it is all about the patient's condition and position. We don't want to scare them any more than we need to. Slamming a spreader or a tool into a car is never, never the right thing to do. You're not gonna get any deeper in with your spreader or your cutter, allow the tool to work for you, okay? So Anthony, I'm gonna have you go either this side or that side, whatever you want, let's see if we can get that door pop. I'm gonna walk around to right here. I'm gonna come right down so you guys can see what's going on. Good. Anthony, I'm gonna have you come right here to right here and just give me a little bit of a push up. There you go. Good, stop right there. So now let's take a look at the gap that we made. Now this is how you find most firefighters. They're standing and looking ready to go for the next operation, right? 
What you want to make sure you're doing is if the cutter needs to come from this angle, come down and look from this angle. This is where your flashlights or your lights really, really come into play. Can I have that uh, torch light for one second, Ant? Thanks so much. Okay, I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to get lights on here so we can see what's going on. So your cutter person should kind of take a look down here. Brent, take a look and tell me if you think you can make that cut or if Anthony needs to gap you just a little bit more. I think it'd be best to gap it a little bit more. I cannot see the nader pin, so it'd be a blind cut at this point. There you go. That's where the communication between your professionals comes into play. Let's give yourself a little bit more of a gap, okay? It's always best to take a look and say, you know what, yeah, I need a little bit more, or no, I don't. And let's give him a little bit on this side. Just give me a push up. We'll get Brent in there to make that cut. Actually, Brent, you think you can make that? Let's take a look. Yeah, I think we can do that. Let's give her a shot. There you go. Let's see. Those rotatable handles are absolutely fantastic. There you go. So did we get it? No, we didn't. All right, Anthony, let's come in here and get a little bit more of a spread up. Let's go straight up if we can. There you go. And then we'll come right into that gap. Give us a little bit more. And there we go. These things always, they're not pretty. Sometimes it's a whole lot of fist fight to get things done. Make sure your cutters are going at the proper angle. Make sure your people have flashlights out, especially if it's dark outside, so they can see the cuts that are being made. We want to make sure your cutters are working at the right angle. Know what your cutter limitations are. If you have a very, very, very small cutter, Make sure that you've got your spreader guy in there to give you a couple of gaps so you can wrap that cutter all the way around the cut you need. Make sure that you're going out into your junkyards or however you get the cars behind and try a couple of different fashions. Does my cutter cut best like this? Does my cutter cut best like this? Does my cutter cut best like this? The other thing you want to keep in mind is when you're coming in to cut a post, we got a question. oh, what do you got? How do you recommend dealing with the cutter walking in if you do not have a New York cook? That's really simple, buy a New York cook. <laughs> It doesn't have to be an actual New York cook, but it has to be made of steel, plain and simple. They're cheap, they're about 150 bucks, it doesn't matter who you buy them from, but having that New York cook will really save your bacon. Now, again, this is with a Genesis tool. I'm not telling you to use this with any other manufacturer's tool, I'm telling you you can do it with ours. It may be something you want to maneuver with, but that's going to be on you. Okay, is there a benefit to using uh, cutters versus spreaders on the hinges, or is it more situational? It's always situational. When your spreader person opens that door, he's gonna know right away if he can get to those hinges efficiently and effectively, okay? Sometimes, especially on the newer cars, you're gonna have those big, giant stamped hinges. I mean, they are a big, solid piece of metal. The older cutters will have a hard time cutting that. One of the things that you don't wanna do is if you have a big piece of steel like this, when you come in with your cutter like this, you're not gonna have the whole strength to cut with. So you may want to adjust your angle to come down. The deeper you get into the throat of that tool, the more effective your cutter will be. And again, this is where perhaps that little escharotomy comes into place. If you can get a sawzall in there to make an initial relief cut, give it a split point, that may be the best thing that you can do. All right, no more questions, but yeah, it's gonna be completely situation. Okay, the last thing you wanna take a look at is, Brent, I'm gonna have you just position your tool, okay? We like to recommend coming in at a 90 degree angle from where you're cutting. Your cutters are going to walk, there's no doubt about it, depending on what's inside this material. And for us, as an extrication person on the scene of an actual incident, I have no way of knowing what's inside here. So I'm gonna give my operator the best opportunity to not get injured or to not have a problem with the tool or injure the tool itself. 
So when you come in from 90 degrees, if the tool walks left or the tool walks right, it really doesn't matter because as long as you keep your finger on that rocker switch, you're pushing that rocker switch the entire time. Okay? You want all the pressure of that tool working to your advantage. What you don't want to do after it takes a good bite is get hung up on holding onto this tool and trying to stop that tool from walking. You're not going to stop it. Be it Anthony's size, Brent's size, or even Cammy's size, okay? Or my size. Fortunately, I was command staff my last couple of years, so I had people that did all this for me. I go, hey, cut here, cut here, here. It was fantastic. I absolutely loved it. But you want to make sure that you know which way that tool is going to walk. If you immediately come in from one side or the other, yes, you're going to get into the throat of that tool a little bit quicker, except for the fact that you're already positioned yourself where that tool is going to walk. I know that if I come from the back, it's going to push me into that side. I know that if I come from the front, it's going to push me into that side. So as long as you're cognizant of where your hands are, where your battery is, or even where the hoses on your corded tools are, that's not a problem. Again, that may be where your New York hook comes into play. Uh, do I got another question? Okay. What are the proper cuts to be made on an electric vehicle? So with an electric vehicle, the, the body, the anatomy of the vehicle is absolutely identical to a standard car. There's no difference in the vehicle anatomy. What you want to watch out for is the big electrical cable. Okay, all EV vehicles have not only their high voltage battery, but they also have a standard 12 volt battery also. You want to find that 12 volt battery, make the cut, DC that connection if at all possible. That's going to start the drain down times of the car itself. Okay, the more you know about the vehicles, go to the manufacturers, go to the dealers in your area and say, hey, walk us through, where are the cables on this particular car? A Tesla is a perfect example. If you open up the front trunk on a Tesla because it doesn't have a hood, you'll see a big sheet of plastic and there's a, a little decal there and a sticker. Pull the plastic down and there's actually a little mark that has a pair of scissors and a fire helmet, I think, on most of them that says cut here. That is the cut loop for you. The entire bottom of that car is the battery. Some of the new BMW EV vehicles, we can't get to their 12 volt system because they're all completely locked in. There's no tools for firefighters to take those things apart to get to. So making the cuts on the electric vehicle, as long as you've stabilized the vehicle as much as possible, got to that 12 volt as much as, or as soon as possible, you can standard, you can make the standard cuts. There's no difference. They're not going to come apart any different. And how will high strength steel affect cut the, uh, high strength steel affect the cuts on the post? So the new steel does not cut like the old steel. The old steel, the tool would walk slowly and it would just, you could hear it just kind of come together and then cut. The new steel gets to a compressional point and it severs itself. It's actually like loud pieces of plastic snapping or even depending on the strength of the material, like a gun going off next to you, okay? One of the things that we'll talk about too is just a post cuts, okay? Right, I'm gonna have you make a couple of post cuts. So Matt, you got this? So we always wanna make sure if we're going to lift a dash that our post can go in the right direction, right? We were always taught years ago, cut down as low as possible. That way you won't drag a patient over an A-post. Hopefully none of you have ever drug a patient over an A-post. I've also had people say, can I cut like this? Straight up and down with the cutter. I'm gonna tell you don't do that because on some of these cars that have the boron bars or the boron rods in there, the second you try to do that, your cutter is going to open and you'll see your blades twist. A good rule of thumb is when you look at a dashboard, see where it humps out to, okay? Make your mark maybe a half inch lower than that. Always cut from the top, okay? When you cut from the top, you give your tool the best angle to maneuver all the way around. If you cut from the bottom, glass dust will get into the cutter blades, the grease that's in between there. Glass is made of sand, and eventually it'll eat that grease away, okay? So, Brent, I'm gonna have you make me one cut right there, please. Actually, I'm gonna have you come up just a little bit. There you go. Perfect. So, here's the other thing to keep in mind. Take a shot at me, Matt. Always have a couple of like grease pencils or markers with you. Have a couple of different colors with you, right? You want to have red because red doesn't show up on a red car. You want to have a blue. You want to have a yellow. So let's take a look at this cut right here, okay? Here is the cut that I just made. If I want to roll this dash forward or ram this dash forward, okay, if the bottom half of my post Pops free, I'm good to go. I can ram, I can spread, I can do whatever I need to. If the cut stays together like it is right now, I'm gonna have my cutter slide up and make me another cut to get it out of the way. If the top 
falls over the bottom due to the impact pressure, I'm gonna slide up and make another cut. I'm not just immediately going to push because this will jam up and it will fight your tool the entire time. So Brett, just come up, eh, maybe a half inch more. Just give me a little bit of a gap there. Not all the way through. Yeah, it is. Is it? Yeah, it's just bound up in there. Okay, perfect. Yep, I can get that out of there. Not a problem. Plastic, I hate plastic. So there you go. Now at this point, we're ready to push, spread, we're ready to do anything because we've got a nice gap, nothing's holding us. So if you gotta roll your dash right now, you're in good shape. Okay, uh, pa -pa -pa -pa. Why, are, why are you cutting the hinges on the door versus just spreading them? It's completely arbitrary as to what's gonna be best for you. Maybe you don't have a cutter that's going to be able to cut the hinges. It's usually faster to cut the hinges, depending on the cutter that you have, than it is to spread, and it's a much less violent reaction. Spreading hinges can be an extremely violent reaction depending on how you are with your spreader. Remember, most people will leave that spreader resting on their leg and they'll angle downward. You always want to get your spreader as horizontal as possible next to the hinge and allow that arc of the spreader to work with the hinges on your door to get that hinge to pop off. Okay. We got any other questions for the moment, Scott? Are we good to go? All righty. Thank you guys very much for watching. I would like to thank Brent Solon, uh, Cammie, and Anthony for giving me a hand today and all the production crew. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to shoot a question in to info at genesisrescue.com. Join us June 21st, correct? Yes. June 21st uh, at noon. That's going to be Eastern time, and that's going to be our fourth live cut series, getting the most of your combination tool. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Thank <music> you.